We are here today with Representative Sue Shear, the Democratic incumbent for the 96th Illinois House seat, who is seeking re-election for the seat in the November 6th election. We appreciate you being here today, Representative Shear, and invite you to start off by just talking a bit about why you've decided to seek re-election and why you think you're the best candidate in this race. Okay, thank you for having me um, here at the Springfield Journal Register. I always appreciate this opportunity because it gives me a chance to uh, let all of my constituents know very clearly how I feel and that I, I care about the people of my district. And that's probably the most important reason why I'm um, seeking re-election is because I do care about the people that I represent. And every day, you know, this takes its priorities. So yet just yesterday something came up and I, um, at a nursing home and I just had to drop everything and go deal with that because I was worried about the people and the heat and the nursing home but that's just a little example um, I was a, a teacher for almost 35 years and at that point this was an open seat and I thought you know we need people um, over fighting for our community at the Capitol who are not politicians, who are just there truly because they care and want to make our district a better place to live. So that is what I have focused on in the time I've been in office. I've tried to focus very desperately on bringing more jobs to our community, uh, bringing um, programs that are similar to ceasefire that help stop violence to make people feel more safe and improve our funding for education. Um, these are things that the reason I'm seeking re-election is I see how far I've come and how much further I dream to get to make our community a better place. And that's why I'm seeking re-election. And if the people feel that what I've done is, um, you know, what they want to have continue to happen, then my record speaks for itself. Okay, well, let, let's start there. You said um, you've seen how far you've come. What do you what do you feel are your your legislative victories during your time in, in the House? Well, if I go back to my first term, uh, the first bill that I tried to sponsor, and it is now law, was changing the age of children to start kindergarten because at that point the school age, believe it or not, on the books was eight years. When they turned eight, they had to be in school. So that was a big, a big um, bill to take on, and all my staff said, that's an awful big bill to take on, your first bill ever. But uh, I worked with uh, lots of other members, and we combined my bill with Toy Hutchison's bill, and we got it across the finish line. And then another one early on was the sign bill. We were spending, I think it was well over $5 million dollars maybe even 10, monitoring highway signs. And you wouldn't believe how hard it was to get that bill passed because the lobbyists were like ants in the woodwork. But we did get that bill passed, and now we don't spend that money on monitoring highway signs. We've cut greatly down on the fleet of cars. Um, the private airplanes to Chicago don't fly anymore. Those were all bills that I had sponsored. Uh, another one that just passed was a drug opioid task force, um, different bills about schools and trying to find ways to find more teachers since we're in a teaching crisis right now of a shortage, um, bringing things for jobs. We just brought a, a lot of money for $1.5 to Richland Community College to help with workforce investment, the high-speed rail project that we continue to stay in touch with Senator Durbin's office on and keep pushing for our side of that. Um, the East Beltway in Decatur is an important project. That's a billion dollar project that we brought 10 million towards that this past year. But you know on the more local um, side we're talking about things like teen reach and summer job programs and um, community intervention programs to stop violence and uh, funding for over a million dollars for Springfield Public Schools. This is something that I've worked on since 1978. So um, 
we try to have a very good uh, services, constituent services, and be accessible to people in my district. I go out and knock on doors almost every day. I will today when we're done here if it isn't raining. And uh, just try to be there for the people when they need us. When they have nowhere else to turn, they know they can call our office and we can either help or point them in the right direction. I noticed recently you were one of the, I think you were the only Democrat on hand for a recent bill signing with several measures that had to do with mental health issues. Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention that. Um, why telehealth is, medicine. Tele tele why is that an issue you've taken up? That was an important issue to me, and it was very interesting to go to the hospitals, both in Decatur and Springfield, and see how this works. But having taught for all these years and dealing with lots of social workers and issues that, that children face, uh, it made me aware, both for children and adults, the need, and I represent some very small communities too, and it makes it difficult for them to get to the hospital or doctor. And even for people in our bigger cities like Springfield and Decatur, they can now do the telehealth medicine out of state, like maybe Mayo Clinic or something even. So um, this is just very critical for people to get services, some people, um, it's, it's a very um, touchy situation with, with um, social problems and emotional problems, and they don't like to go to the doctor. Well, this way they can stay at home and do it on their computer. And um, actually, I received an award for that bill, and uh, it's a real, I, I should have brought it, it's a really cool picture uh, that was on the cover of a magazine in, I think, 1929. And it was looking to the future, and they didn't call it telehealth medicine then. They called it the radio doctor or something. Mm -hmm. But it's just a modern version of all the things that were in that picture of the award they gave me for that. Mm -hmm. What else do you see that Illinois needs to do to you know, provide mental health services? Are there still unmet needs out there? Oh, the, as big as this room, the needs that we have for mental health. We need to provide more services. We need to quit making schools and jails and prisons as dumping grounds for people with mental health issues. We need to um, take care of these people, early intervention. And that's one thing with my telehealth bill that, that just the governor just signed uh, maybe two weeks ago. Um, if we can get this early prevention, think of how much that's going to affect so many other things how much it will help that person and their family, but also how much that will help the prison population, how much that will help um, gun ownership, how much that will help uh, other people who, you know, robberies occur because of drugs and the need for the money, and that comes from oftentimes from a mental health issue. So um, that that's just so, a something that's near and dear to my heart. Deb Conroy, a good friend of mine who's another state representative, is the chairman of the Mental Health Committee, and um, she and I talk often about, you know, this happens, that happens, what can we do to try to make it better? I do want to um, talk a little bit about the finances of our state, which okay. are, are not great, and um, I want to ask about a particular vote you made during your tenure in office. You had, uh, in the past, expressed reservations about voting in favor of a tax increase. Mm -hmm. You did not vote for the original legislation last year that increased the income tax, but you did for the overview. So walk us through mm -hmm. what led to that vote change. Okay, that was uh, a very long and complicated process. We had, at that point, gone around 750 days, well over two years, heading into three years without a budget. And as a grandmother, I saw what effect it was having on my grandkids in their schools. As, as I went door to door, I saw what was happening to people who were losing services that they depended desperately on. And so in the beginning, the reason that I voted against it is because I felt there were other ways to get the money. I felt that we should pass a millionaire's tax, which I sponsored and voted for but it didn't, you know, we couldn't get the votes. So then I tried to go a different way and close corporate loopholes. Some large corporations pay no tax. 
So I thought if we could close some loopholes, we could get money that way to offset the loss that we'd had in the tax revenue. There's also a tax that um, the retail merchants get when they um, collect the tax and then they turn it into the state. It's a matter of having a software program and pushing a button. And they can get up to 2 or 3% back, reimbursed back to the Walmart or whoever for pushing that button and having that software, where in other states they get nothing. Or they maybe get a half a percent or at most 1%. But we're way above what other states get on that. So those were the avenues that I tried to pursue and just kept hitting a brick wall. And I could not get other members to vote and the governor to sign to pass those things. So then when the vote came, the governor just flat out vetoed the budget. Just flat out vetoed it. He did not do a line item where he can pick apart and say, yes, we'll keep this. No, we don't want that. He just vetoed the whole thing. So now um, it's around the 4th of July. We're heading into three years with no budget. And we're going, our state is going to the next day be declared junk bond status, which means you're unable to borrow money at anywhere without paying like maybe 12, 15% interest because of our junk bond status. Um, our universities, our public universities, some of them were closing the next day. It's just unheard of what state of affairs we were in. For my own district where I care so deeply, we had 30,000 state workers were gonna be losing their jobs according to IDOT records. We had 12,000 people going to be deprived of breast and cervical cancer screenings that people depend desperately on for, to live. And so at that point, I felt like I had no other choice. But it was like the governor just wouldn't go along with anything that we tried. I didn't feel like I created the crisis, and yet as a state representative, it was my responsibility to try to help solve it. So I would be over here every night after being at session all day, and I would go out to dinner or walk in the park or walk in the neighborhoods with different representatives from the other side of the aisle, several Republican representatives and a small group from, of Democrats. We would go out and we would discuss, okay, how are we going to get the votes? What are we going to do? How are we going to get a budget? And at this point, it became abundantly clear that the only way to solve the budget pro problem was to have Democrats and Republicans to all get on board and realize that, that there was no other way that anyone was willing to pass except for that. Okay. So then the next day, that's when that happened. Okay. Do you stand by that decision to vote in that manner? I do because nobody wants to have to take that vote. Yeah. And I certainly didn't. And I sleep at night because I know I tried everything humanly possible to get a budget that the governor would sign, and he just, I mean, at the end of the, of the day, he never did sign any budget. So we had to do it without him. And we couldn't do it with any of those other tax revenues because we couldn't get him to sign any of those. I'm sorry, doubling back, did you say 30,000 state workers in your district? 30,000 state workers, according to IDOT, of which many of them are in my okay, district okay. because I represent Springfield and Decatur and the little towns. Lot. Uh, we probably have the most state workers of any district. Maybe Chicago has more, but. Okay. If given the chance, um, if there was an effort to roll back the tax increase, would you be in favor of doing so? You know, I would. If we had a different way to get the revenue that didn't hurt middle class people, and you know, maybe with different representatives in there, they would pass the millionaire tax. The things that I saw of ways to save, there, my dad used to always say there's two ways to save money. You either take more in or you put less out. So I've done everything I can on both sides, especially in the put less out. Like I mentioned earlier, the airplanes, are grounded, um, fighting tooth and nail to get a smaller fleet of cars, especially the cars that are just sitting out in the lots and yet not being used. They need to be sold. They're not helping anyone. And then the sign bill, and I mean, the list goes on and on of things that I've done to try to bring in the revenue. 
uh, other ways, corporate loopholes. Um, how about the perks that we give to corporations that then Sears the very next day, they go offshore and we never get the money back that we gave them as an incentive. That happens all the time. So, you know, we can't keep going to middle class people and working families and say, you solve the problem. And, and yet on the other side say, but here, here's your millionaires. You can keep all these, you know, these high profits that you're making, corporations. We're not going to touch you. We're not going to touch uh, just the whole gamut. It's just very frustrating that they just think, oh, well, you know, that's the easy way out. So I've tried all those ways. So if we can go back to getting the money from one of these places, I'm all for it. That, that brings up, you know, J.B. Pritzker, as we know, has proposed going to a graduated income tax in the state. Um, is this, you know, something you would support? And what details do you have to know to be able to support it? That's what I've said all along. The concept to me is fine to have a graduated tax rather than a flat tax. And for our viewers who may not know the difference, a flat tax is everybody pays the same percent. It's different in the federal government, it's graduated, but in the state government, it's flat. Um, and so the reason that I have not gone on as a sponsor is that very thing. When I can see that it won't hurt the middle class or the working families, I'll be all for it. But until I can see that, I'm not going to just blanketly say, yes, I'm for just whatever anybody says. Talk a bit about um, when you use terms like working class, middle class. Uh -huh. Give us a ballpark of what kind of income you know, ranges you're thinking about when you say those. Well, you know, there's not like a, a set, a die in die hard number because those numbers change with our economy every year. But when you look at, I would look at it more as you look at the families who live in, not in mansions, but in regular homes or trailers or small apartments. Um, it might be a mom and dad both working and they may have a couple kids and their kids are in school or they're saving for them to go to college. Those kind of income are the incomes that I want to protect. Now, if you have people who live in a swanky mansion with four cars and three homes, that's why I think the millionaire tax is good because it just, you know, if, if you make over a million dollars, you get taxed at the flat rate like everyone else up to a million. And then you go over a million is the only area where you pay a higher percentage. Because I think anybody can live on a million dollars. I know the people in this room would probably not mind that. <laughs> probably not. Um, even with the tax increase, we still face a lot of financial uh, difficulties in Illinois. Uh, the side of board would argue the biggest one is the unfunded pension liability, which is about $130 billion. How do you propose the state address this? This has been a problem not just since I came in office, but it goes back to when the General Assembly and the governor robbed the um, state punch pension system of first year they took a pension holiday of one billion dollars the next year it was two billion dollars I can tell you the exact spot where I was standing in the hall outside my classroom when I said you just can't recover from this how do you recover from shorting the pension system three billion dollars over two years and I said mark my words they're going to say the whole problem goes back on let's put it on the backs of the teachers and the state workers and sure enough you know that wasn't that long ago it was maybe less than 10 years ago and sure enough, they think that the problem should be solved on the backs of the teachers and state workers. Now, there are some teachers who are like professors at universities that are making astronomical size pensions, like a $150,000 pension. But they're, they're the, the rare. They're not the norm. That's definitely not the mean. That's definitely not the average. So... Um, I just think that it's one of the deals where, like it or not, the state needs to pay their part into the pensions, and then there won't be a pension crisis. But obviously, 
um, when you write a constitution that says pensions will not be diminished or impaired, and then you spend every waking minute trying to figure out how you can diminish or impair them, you've created your own monster. So I feel at this point, the courts have been abundantly clear that this will be allowed and this will not. And I feel that the state has done everything they can to get their hands on teachers' pensions. And now they need to let that be and go on to other things. We are right now in a historic moment in Illinois where we are in a severe teacher crisis shortage in every grade all throughout the state. Every grade, every, everywhere. I know, I know of a, a large school that started the year 67 teachers short. I know the districts are just crying and begging for teachers. And yet I'm answering questions about, well, why should we pay money into teachers' pensions? Well, because we need teachers. And obviously the teachers, the young people who are in college now, have seen how much they're appreciated. This is how much you're appreciated. Every interview I go to, well, what could we do about the pensions? How can we take money away from the teachers? Then you go home and you watch the news. Oh, there was just a shooting in Florida and they killed how many students and whose responsibility was it? The teacher who was trained how to teach reading and math, not how to put off a gunman. You know, and then we talk about test scores. Oh, well, you know, that kid didn't know any of their colors or shapes in kindergarten, but they're not up to the snuff that we want. Let's publish that score in the front page of the paper and let's blame it on the teacher. I mean, it's like, well, they have social issues. Well, it's up to the teacher to fix those social issues. It's just like everything that's wrong with society has been blamed on education. And, and to add in injury to insult, tell me somewhere I have gone where I haven't been asked this question. It's like, why won't people leave that alone and pay in the way they're supposed to? Well, then they'll say, because we can't afford it. Oh, yay, I asked this question. Can we afford to give the corporations the loopholes they're getting? Can we afford to give Sears that money and then they take it offshore? Can we afford to give large corporations who pay zero tax? I don't hear anybody asking me about that. I don't hear anybody asking me about that little 3% that, that the Walmarts of the world get back. And I'm not picking on Walmart and Sears. They're just right. easy examples. But look a few states over. They don't, they don't get that money back. Well, then we could use that money to put into the pensions that were promised to begin with. Mm -hmm. And then we talk about salary, and the governor just vetoed the 40000 minimum wage for teachers. I, do you know how many teachers are on free lunch? Do you know how many of them qualify for social programs that are free because they don't make enough to earn a living and have to go work a night job? And yet we say we respect teachers. Well, we need to put our money where our mouth is. Well, getting back to pensions, as you've noted, the courts have been pretty clear on the y'all you know, that you can't go back and change the deal on someone who's already getting a pension. But going forward, are there any steps you see that the state could take you know, I, or needs to change, or should the system just stay in place as it is? I truthfully feel that they have scraped the last drop of batter out of the bowl. I mean, especially in this last budget, they changed everything within the letter of the law. There's nothing left to be changed. Mm -hmm. okay. But like I said, my dad said in the beginning, there's more than one way to fund a pension. You either put more in, take less out. Well, it seems like the only thing that people can see is take less out. Um, you brought up the, you know, we cannot diminish pension benefits that have been earned. Would mm -hmm. you believe um, or do you think the Constitution should be amended to change that? I do not. Okay. I think our forefathers knew what was coming when they put that sentence in. It cannot be diminished or impaired. And I feel that the reason they put it in is they knew that there would be some crooked people at the Capitol who would try to take that money 
and build things like a McCormick Place instead of funding teacher pensions. Okay. And, you know, that pretty much says it all, if you ask me. AFSCME and other workers like that that are on the IMRF, their pension isn't in bad shape because it's in the Constitution that their pension has to be funded before they start spending it on other things. So we don't discuss that as a problem because it's been funded all along. Okay. Um, I know we're getting a little tight on yeah. time. While we're on education, yes. can you talk to us, now that the reformed school funding formula has been out there for a year, um, how do you see that going? Is there anything that you feel needs to be changed with it? I feel like it's going in the right direction. Any program that is that far reaching, right from the beginning is gonna, there are gonna be bumps in the road that need to be evened out. I know in Springfield, um, Andy Cater, both districts have gotten well over a million dollars. Um, new funding, in addition mm -hmm. to the funding that they used to have. And so it's just kind of figuring out now what is the best way to um, use that money. And I feel that it, the, I like how the bill was, was written. We're leaving it up to the professionals to make that decision. Is there anything else you'd like to see changed or added or the, the next steps that need to happen with funding? Uh, we need to fully fund. Once again, you know, well, what, well, that's we don't want to fully fund pensions. We don't want to fully fund um, the uh, state aid for schools, but we, we don't have a problem fully funding edge tax credits no. and all that. But that would so, take, I think, I mean, an estimated, I, I'm going to not have the exact figure here, but I want to say it's between seven and eight billion additional dollars. Where would we get that money from it, to fully well, fund the formula? That's my right, understanding. Right, right. And when said. I say fully fund the formula, when you get into the actuarials, they will say fully funded doesn't have to be at 100% for them to okay. still get the money that they need. Okay. So I would say at the full amount that the actuarials say needs to be done. Um, you just mentioned edge tax credits, actually. Um, one of our questions is, you know, as you mentioned, one challenge for the state would be bring more money in. Uh -huh. What would you like to see happening for economic development in terms of the statewide strategy? Um, I'm actually the chairman of a new committee that I, I initiated of, of my own, and that is business incentives for local communities. And so I would like to see more tax credits developed for things like that. And I have a quarterly meetings with local business leaders. And one thing that I hear repeatedly is that the edge credits are all about more jobs. And I, I like that and we need that. We also, I feel, need some sort of a tax credit that deals with the... Um, technological side of things that perhaps it can be based on something that has to do with new patents or enhanced performance um, hiring more people at higher wages that kind of thing it's it would it will it's something I'm looking at and it's going to have to be a very involved bill with a lot of detail to it to make it worthwhile Okay, um, if elected to the seat again and the Democrats retain the House, will you vote for Michael Madigan for another term as House Speaker? I get asked that question a lot, and I, I think it's kind of humorous because Inauguration Day isn't until January. I haven't got elected yet, and we don't know who will be on the ballot to be elected uh, for the Speaker. So when the day comes and I see who's on the ballot, I think that it would be great to vote for the person that of my choices who will bring the most for my community. Has there been any other times you voted for a speaker? Has there been anyone besides Mike Madigan available for that? And in the time that I've been in, it has been him or Jim Durkin, who, you know, they've both been in there forever. Durkin's been in there over 20 years. Bill Brady at, in the Senate side has been there over 25 years. Madigan's been in there, I don't even know how long, over 30. And so the options are quite limited, but maybe this year will be the year. You never know. Do you think Speaker Madigan has been an effective leader? Um, in some ways, very effective. In other ways, no. And we could probably say that about anybody. In what ways has he not? Well, I have a whole list of bills that 
I disagree with what he thinks we should do on different things, and we just most recently in my mind was pensions. That's one of them. But, um, you know, there are a lot of bills that I feel he's more liberal than I am as a Democrat. So he pushes more to a liberal side where I'm more conservative Democrat, which is pretty much right down the middle. Well, we um, appreciate you for meeting with us today, and we invite you to give a closing statement, kind of your um, your elevator pitch, essentially, as to why okay. you think you should be the victor on election night for the 96th House District seat. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, once again, I really appreciate the opportunity of being here, and I would um, like people to look at my voting record, and I feel that it speaks for itself. My main thing that other representatives encouraged me before I took this office was make sure every night you can sleep and you know that what you did that day was the best thing you could do for your community. It's not an easy job. There are days that I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy, but there are other days where it's very fulfilling and you really feel like you're making a difference. I know every day when I get up and start my work day, I start by saying a prayer and to God help point me in the right direction and do what's best for the people of my district. I have to worry about the whole state because I am a state representative, but at the end of the day, if it's gonna help Chicago and not hurt us, I don't have a problem with it. But if it's gonna hurt my district, I will never support something that I feel will hurt my district. I don't take votes that someone else tells me I have to do this, I have to do that. I've always thought for myself and I still think for myself.